first time I remember seeing Tolly, I was really impressed because he was working with my my dad's dad, my papa Lewis, and they were doing some uh, wonderful uh, carpentry work. And I was a paint contractor at the time, and I'd seen a lot of different carpenters and work behind them, and and their work was just incredible. And uh, so I was really impressed at his expertise and attention to detail and doing a, a real fancy stairway and, uh, and, and other other work too, a bunch of Wayne's coating and uh, and then the other thing, he just seemed to really love life and uh, always had his fruit trees and a little garden and uh, so he'd go see my mom, and my mom said, I can't believe he doesn't even hold the rails going up. I mean, like two years ago or something, a year ago, he came to visit her and just walked straight up the, the uh, steps to her front porch, you know, back down, didn't even grab the handrail. <laughs> I'm really grateful that they stood up for us like that. And, you know, they, they went through a lot, and you know, we, we forget and, and times changed, I mean, so much, you know, so you know, we could really learn from them. You know, just the basic skills of life, you know, how they different, different things, you know. Uh, we don't appreciate things as much as we should. We lived on Pete's Highway in Venom Springs, and up till 1933. In 1933, we picked up and moved to a place called Sherman over by Crotch Springs. And it was a little sawmill town and whatnot, and we were sharecrop farmers. And uh, my mother and us five kids, and uh, a sometimes stepdad. And, uh, but we raised cotton and corn and uh, peanuts and whatever that we could sell to because if we didn't have it, uh, we didn't have it if we didn't grow it. I mean, there just wasn't any money because this, this was in 1933, that Great Depression that was going at that time. And uh, we had really high quality living quarters. We had no electricity. We had no indoor plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the well was out in the yard where we had to pump our own water and the outhouses were a hundred feet from the house and with a big moon sign on the door. <laughs> but we lived there to 1939 uh, and uh, I, actually it, it in some extent, it, it was kind of heaven to boys like myself. Um, parents didn't walk around with their kids by the hand all the time back then. If you went out, <coughs> if we wanted to go somewhere, we went. And uh, if we wanted to go swimming, we could go swimming or hunting or whatever. Uh, the parents weren't concerned about you because they knew you could look after yourself. We had a four-room schoolhouse and um, w with an auditorium. And the only thing is we only had two teachers. The one teacher taught first through the third grade and the other one the fourth uh, through the seventh. And my oldest sister was the only one in her grade at that time. But, um, actually, it, it was pretty good in, in ways because uh, while a teacher, we was in the same room with the students, you know, and as a teacher questioned them and went over stuff in other grades, well then you absorbed a certain amount of it. We moved back to Baton Rouge in uh, 39, and I had been going to Livonia High School and I fit right in with them. When I moved back there, I started school in 
uh, uh, Baton Rouge High, and it was so different. I was kind of lost in it and so forth. So that's that's why I decided that that I wanted to join the Navy, and it worked out all right. So, and I asked my mother if I could join the Navy at Christmas time, and she said yes. And I was 17, and uh, and then they had Pearl Harbor, which changed her mind, and uh, and made me think too. But uh, she finally changed her mind. We we really didn't think anything about age at that at that point. Uh, I mean, we just had jobs that we had to do, so uh, whatever we had to do them. I joined the Navy on December the 29th of 1941, and everything was in a real hurry there. And they they shipped us to New Orleans for swearing in, and, um, and then they put us on a train, said we'd be in San Diego in a couple of days. Well, two days later we were in Norfolk, and uh, so, but on, <coughs> January the 2nd of 42, we started boot camp. On January the 21st, we graduated from boot camp. We had three whole weeks of boot camp. <laughs> and the next day, we went on board the battleship New York. And um, it was kind of a shock to a, somebody that had never been anything bigger than a pillow while I was growing up. <laughs> I guess two weeks later, after I went aboard, was we were taking a convoy to Iceland. And talk about moving from one temperature to the other. It, um, Iceland is close to the Arctic Circle and whatnot. And it being in February and early March, um, everything was iced over. And, um, it worried me because all our big guns and everything were covered with ice and what, <laughs> so forth. And um, at that time, the German razor, raider ships were still active up there. And we didn't see one. And I, I suppose that uh, the guns would fire because it, no one else seemed to be concerned about it. <laughs> I was in the Navy for almost four years. and took part in the North African invasion and the Normandy invasion. Our job that day was to escort troops into the, into the beach. And uh, it was, it was kind of scary. It was, wasn't, be, actually it wasn't as bad as the North African invasion in my exposure. On the North African invasion, uh, where we escorted uh, well, Patton and his troops and whatnot were, at that point we were fighting the Vichy French. We weren't fight, wasn't fighting the Germans on those particular fronts. And I like to include that because there's a lot of people that didn't realize that. On the Normandy invasion, I was the po uh, pointer on 40 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. And luckily, we didn't have a plane to shoot at, so it, but uh, we had the shells falling around us, to, not a lot of them, but some. I was on what they call a submarine chaser. It was a wooden ship, 110 foot long, 18 foot beam, and uh, it was used to escort towing vehicles and also searching for submarines. So anyway, it didn't have much of a draft. So they used us to escort the troops into the beachhead. And on the way in, it, it, it got your attention that water was full of bodies already that early, that was early June 6th considered the Omaha Beach, it, it was the difference between day and night and then the amount of fighting and killing going. Uh, there was just enough uh, 
on Utah, which is one we escorted him to, that um, rocket ships and other things like that, uh, actually barges, they were just loaded with bar uh, lines and lines of <coughs> rockets, and they were fired into the head of, on the beaches ahead of us, making them land. And, and uh, that was really impressive. People wanted to know how I liked being in the service. And uh, I told them I, <coughs> I liked it real good, except when they were trying to kill me. <laughs> the day that the planes crashed into the trade centers in New York, we were standing there in the entryway of the Spectrum uh, Health Club and saw the first one hit and everybody thought, well, that's an accident. And we stood there a few minutes and saw the other one hit. So um, that, that got your attention and we stood there tall and, and <clears throat> watched them crumple and just fall down just in a straight line, which um, I kind of expected them to lean or something, but they didn't. The, the first first thought after seeing it start was, you know, <clears throat> wondering who was behind it because it certainly didn't, wasn't two accidents in a row. Really made <clears throat> us, I don't know, upset or what, uh, angry about who would do something to the United States. And um, I don't know that there was ever anything to um take care of the people that was, uh, other than the people that were actually on the planes. Uh, my daughter and granddaughter worked a lot with the program to get this set up and whatnot. And I really didn't quite know what to expect or how many people are here. And, and it really, really pulled at my heart with all these people that uh, would take time to so forth to come up. And some of them I haven't seen in years actually, And uh, but they're still family. And um, we, we connect either by group meetings or uh, telephone. And earlier this year, we had a a group get together with uh, Calvin Blunt and, and all the families and whatnot. And uh, that was really a first class setup. And, uh, and we probably had as many people there as we did here today to it. But <clears throat> I always think of our family as being Blunt's. Uh, like my mother was a maiden name was a was a blunt, and every all everyone always considered it how hard headed all the blunts were. <laughs> so um, we agreed to that, but it helped us to if we got started on something that meant we were, we were going to do it. Happy